Hello, I'm Thomas Pogge, the director of the Yale Global Justice Program, one of the sponsoring organizations of this event. Co-sponsors are the Orville Shell Center for International Human Rights at Yale Law School and the Yale Pointer Fellowship in Journalism, which is sponsoring the visit to Yale this semester of our moderator, Khadija Sharife, as a Pointer Fellow. Based in South Africa, Khadija is an award-winning investigative journalist and senior editor for Africa at Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, OCCRP. Her focus is on illicit financial flows, natural resources, and political economy. Sharife is the former director of Plateforme de Protection de Lanceurs d'Alerte en Afrique, and currently also a board member of Finance Uncovered. She has worked with forums including the Pan-African Parliament, the African Union, the OECD, and UNEP. She is the author of Texas, If You Can, Africa. Without further ado, I will hand it over to Khadija now. Thank you. And whistleblowers are effectively the litmus test for governance on the continent. More than 80% of countries in Africa lack any whistleblower or protected disclosure laws. Many of the countries uh, that don't have it are either dictatorships, the authoritarian regimes, for example, in the Congo Basin, five dictatorships rule over massive oil reserves. And that means that any attempt at uh, disclosure of information, um, at accountability, at democracy is effectively quashed. But in Southern Africa, the region is ruled by dominant political parties, and while they do have a kind of protected disclosure law, uh, for the most part, they have also inherited and weaponized laws such as the Cape Libel Act, the Official Secrets Act, to ensure that if anything touches against the state power, what in South Africa has been called state capture, but which is a two-decade-old term that speaks to the process after decolonization of the captured economy, those people will be imprisoned, they'll be fined, they'll be harassed. And the, the people that we're speaking with today are very brave souls who bore witness uh, much in the way that prophets did when they became conscious of what was happening and they decided at their own expense to put themselves on the front line of the society whose interest, the public interest and the public good that was being decimated. Uh, our main speaker tonight, William Badong, is the founder of uh, Sherpa, which was an NGO created to prosecute economic crimes. He later founded the Platform for the Protection of African Whistleblowers after defending people such as Edward Snowden, uh, Herb Falciani of Swiss Leaks, who's also a guest tonight, uh, Lux Leaks, and many, many other whistleblowers whose names we will never know. And they are, in fact, the safest, um, those who remain anonymous. So I'd like to introduce our first guest, uh, who's Herb Falciani. He was an HSBC employee who became a whistleblower. In 2008, he turned over details of 100,000 accounts from more than 200 countries. And this was worth $100 billion in assets dating back to 1988. He shared it with governments, including France and Spain. Some of these accounts were used by shell companies uh, and other legal vehicles that camouflage criminal and uh, corrupt activities. For example, Venezuela alone had more than $10 billion offshore. That's an oil-backed economy. But others were real people, high net worth individuals and companies that sought to evade their taxes from where it would be illegal in the country where the activity is taking place to elsewhere where a jurisdiction like Switzerland has made it technically legal by commercializing their legal and financial sovereignty. Uh, so the, the very unique thing that came about from the Swiss Leaks data was, which was given to Le Monde and then later made global by ICIJ through a very big collaboration, is that it also looked at notes, notes about clients and notes between bankers and clients, because for the most part, until the Tax Justice Network began to academically investigate, and until uh, ICIJ and other media partners began to break through the globalized misconception that legal and financial secrecy was something exceptional and not normalized within global financial markets. This is something that remained the domain of movies and of spy novels. The, the movie The Firm, for example, looked at the Cayman Islands and how the mafia laundered their money through those systems. Um, now, in theory, bankers like doctors and priests have an oath of confidentiality, but in practice, only one of them can actually kill. 
Uh, and in the case of HSBC, you know, it was a bank that was formed during uh, the, the second opium war when Britain wanted to protect its balance of trade. They were importing so much from China. The only thing they could really export was opium. And so they fought uh, multiple wars to have it legalized. And that's where the essence of HSBC came from. And so uh, later on, when it was found out that they were laundering money for the Mexican drug cartel, maybe to normal citizens, it was a shock. But when you look at the anatomy of banking structures and accounting firms and law firms, you see that from, from inception, these are entities that exist as conduits, as a very opaque financial services industry that erodes corruption, uh, that, that erodes democracy in developing countries and siphons money from the global south. So Switzerland, like the Netherlands, like the US is Delaware, they often escape the venom that's attributed to donor dependent, politically vulnerable, small island economies. So in the Seychelles, citizens are very poor, they have no control over their government, and those governments are caught between coconuts and criminality. But a government like Switzerland and Luxembourg and the Netherlands, they have political capital, they have stability, and that is why money from the global south goes there to rest, and sometimes, when the dictators are overthrown, that money goes there to die permanently in those banks. Uh, so when Falciani broke this ceiling, he not only exposed HSBC, but he exposed the legal design of seemingly credible and civilized first world nations like Switzerland that make money from the destruction of the global south, that impoverish citizens, that drain public budgets, and that help to prop up dictatorships, authoritarian regimes, and very corrupt uh, economies. And this is why the Swiss government hunted him, because in every other country in the world, tax evasion and criminal and corrupt activities are a crime. But in Switzerland, in 1934, they enshrined something called the Banking Secrecy Act. Well, it was called the Banking Act, but it's a Banking Secrecy Act. And if you breach it, you can go to jail. So they hunted him all around the world, arrest warrants, extradition orders. But governments gave him refuge, including Spain, which recovered more than half a billion dollars based on the information that he provided them. So to the rest of the world, Falciani, like many of our other whistleblowers tonight, whom we'll introduce just before they speak, is a hero. And to meet him, you think that you're meeting a movie star because he's such a cool, very, very cool character. And yet the man has gone through a struggle of not only confronting a bank that was formed as a cartel to launder drug money, but a government that has defeated many, many developing country governments all over the world when they try to recover assets. So without much further ado, we'll turn it over to her Falciani. Well, I'm not sure that uh, I can follow this, this introduction uh, in any way, but uh, Let's say that I'm. I prepared a short, a short part of a, of a song, maybe to, to, to give you a takeaway about uh, what um, what I went through those last uh, twenty years. And this song, you you may I adapted just the first part, but it's about um, it's a song really well known, you know, from uh, Bill Holiday. It's um, it's <laughs> it's starting like that, you know. Uh, it cost me a lot, but if there one thing that I've got is my fight. Of course, it's not only my fight, okay? But uh, it turned out that uh, 20 years ago, I wake up and things were pretty clear. It, it was indeed a misunderstanding, right? A big misunderstanding because 20 years ago, I've been hired by HSBC in Monte Carlo and with the objective to enhance, to improve their uh, IT system, All right? I was an analyst, no developer, no nothing, rather than an analyst coming from another bank, the Monte Carlo Casino Bank. Then when I joined this, uh, this this bank, you know, I was pretty enthusiastic and I was really motivated to to what to to improve their system. To this, and what kind of system I'm talking about was the client order system. And indeed, we improved it. We improved it in such a way that uh, after just a, a few months, 
we discovered that uh, crooks, like a crooks account officer, were uh, stealing money from their own clients. And so for me, it's, it ended up, you know, resulted that, uh, yeah, I was on the right track, on the right track to improve the bank there. And uh, for that reason, I, I continued, you know, uh, suggesting and exposing big problems that I, I was observing and discovering in the, in the bank structures. And so on and so forth that from Monte Carlo, that was just a, a little part of the group, I've been invited to participate to, to bigger project. And I ended up working for the, the head, the headquarter of the private bank in Geneva. And in Geneva, I, I went there and of course, I for years, you know, just improved systems and until uh, the last one that ended up being the, uh, the system used to, to manage uh, subprimes. Forex and other money papers. And my last contribute to HSBC was just uh, to disclose that um, internally, of course, at the time, that there were big problems. There were huge problems with the system in terms of compliance. And if I was talking about, uh, let's say, misunderstanding, it was because I was convinced that my role there was to clean it up but to improve the system. And when I said, you know, it was uh, in 2008, in front of the architects, technical architects, I was at that time head of technical analysts, that there were many risks that our uh, derivative uh, billing systems could be used to launder a huge amount of, uh, of money, you know. I felt a bit, you know, like um, puzzling, puzzled because of course, no big reaction, no big uh, move or change in, in the agenda. But at, the, at that time, I already contacted, you know, with many officials. I sent internally in an uh, anonymous way, uh, of course, a field, I filled a a report to the local Switzerland uh, administration in charge of controlling such, uh, such things, you know, in Switzerland, it was FINMA at the time. And also I, I just turned to, to lawyers to, to find a way to, how could, he, could I do anything to that, you know? But uh, at that time it was, as it is for today, a big issue to, to understand what to do. And to give you an, also another aspect of uh, what uh, of the problem I'm talking about, well, just right now, at that time, at that right time, at that uh, in this and for years, in this day and for years, the the Switzerland government and the highest uh, legal institution, you know, the tribunal. Uh, is confronted to, to request for more than 30 countries, around the 33 countries are still waiting for them to answer their requests because they are investigating many cases from the HSBC case, of course, and they don't have the support from them and they're still waiting for them to say yes or to receive a yes or no. And uh, what is interesting is that this big institution is not able to deal with the problem. It's still puzzled with the problem. And, and the problem is uh, usually, you know, when in Switzerland uh, they were confronted to such a problem, they, they used to what? To find a uh, someone guilty, you know, someone to blame. And uh, they, the problem is that in this case, they already blame me, you know, and they already condemned me for espionage. And espionage, why? because I just collaborated with justice and even more in a legal way. What is also interesting from a legal point of view is that apart from the fight about preserving evidence, 
about getting those evidence, of course, and avoiding them to be altered because it's a pretty big risk, of course, for, uh, for information to be altered. We also struggled to get those evidence uh, produced in a trial and opening trial and opening justice actions against who need to be pursued. And that were, uh, of course, in my journey about, um, about um, during this fight, you know, I, I've been really lucky, you know, because in addition to, to have the support for many, of course, services, secret services, intelligence services, administrations that were struggling to just uh, manage the case, I then added that one particular and really uh, bold action came from lawyers like William Bourdon that we really hear and, and uh, journalists, courageous journalists like Adija and others from ICIG and others. And it was uh, part of, uh, this, let's say, this, uh, this fight that we will have and we, we had together to do something really hard that was to convince politicians. Because one of the big issues that uh, we've been confronted along this uh, journey was to find the right politician supporting and letting at the, at, at, at the worst, you know, at least, the, uh, the justice do their job. We, I, I won't expose all the, the, the complexity or what was obliged to, to set up to access to the legal system in Europe you know, and other countries. Uh, I told you about 33 countries expecting feedback from, uh, from Switzerland. But even in, in countries where uh, it was pretty, um, pretty known that uh, they were uh, against, uh, against uh, tax havens, whereas even in those countries, audience were not uh, mobilized, you know, and, and we had and I had to, to rely on journalists to get this audience aware about what was ongoing. And uh, we had to, let's say, uh, pay pass to, to Spain, for instance, to trigger, you know, investigation that, uh, that were legitimate, but because of what we did, for instance, in Spain, where we uh, um, obtained for our efforts in France, in, in Spain, we've been involved later on to trigger investigation also in other countries like French. And why? Because politicians at that time, not only uh, because it, there were uh, politicians changing, government change, changes, then they, for this reason, it was acceptable for, for justice to make the, the job. But of course, uh, no, 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 no point there that without audience, without journalists, it would have been possible to uh, to to pass from uh, let's say a kind of fisc uh, fiscal and tax in investigation like IRS, you know, uh, in uh, equivalent of IRS in France, to pass from this to a legal real uh, investigation. You know? It, it's, it's been blocked and it was one of the reasons why I had to pass by, uh, by Spain, who, where the law are, are a bit different, you know, uh, to, uh, to, to trigger and to, to move on all those things. As a result, and when I, I look forward, you know, all those uh, 20, 20 years before that are still ongoing in many aspects. And when I see what I'm dedicating to, you know, right now, uh, I'm, a bit, I'm a bit puzzled because if it's, ge it's getting even worse in technical terms, you know, where when you, you see what the industry, what the financial industry, the banking industry is becoming, I'm still working and I'm still in, you know, I'm, I'm advising uh, investment funds. And, I'm try, uh, and I try to, to orient the best uh, startups that are fine fintechs and, uh, and Europe, you know, and when I see what they are doing and what is possible to do, the problem is that even worse right now that has been for years. And, um, and I don't know what I should, I should suggest to, 
to other people that, uh, like me, may be confronted to, to a fight and why we'll have to decide uh, or not to, to enter in this, into this fight, I will just say then, you know, uh, please, first of all, consider you, try to consider if you are yourself uh, keen to, to go to fight, to go to battle, because this is what it is about, you know, it's about, uh, and the other person that we will hear tonight, uh, I'm sure that uh, they will agree with, with that aspect. It's a matter of uh, wanting to fight so, for something, to stand up for something, you know, to, f to find a reason why to, to fight. And, um, and once you, you are in, in, in this direction, when you have decided that, well, uh, depending on the domain we are in, it may be endless. <laughs> so um, as of today, you, you, you will be surprised because I'm, I'm amazed when I see that, uh, you know, I'm confronted every day in my day work to, to, to situation that will, that will um, deserve, you know, uh, a big treatment. But uh, because of the experience, uh, we, I had, we had with, uh, with all the, the, the person that, you know, well, many of the person that we hear tonight. I, I'm not convinced that, uh, no more convinced that uh, the legal way is the only the best way. You know? I guess that uh, as of today, there are alternatives, there are technological alternatives. And because why? Because you have the example that most of the problem are happening in the gray line outside of the law, you know, in, in um, an unprotected landscape. I will give you just a, an illustration of that. You, you, everyone heard about, about what has, it was happening about Bitcoins. And indeed, I, I'm really involved in, in many uh, crypto projects. But this is the exact illustration of what is happening right now in front of us and we thought a clear understanding of what is happening but what is happening it's against the law it's totally against the law and not inside the law because apart from the law but it's kind of an extension of why we are here tonight so but i i, I insist in that you know uh, just with this example of uh, what is happening about around bitcoin you have a representation of the, of the problem we are facing. We don't only have to, to demonstrate what is ongo that what is ongoing, what you are a witness of is bad, but you have to find a way also to pursue that. I mean, to sue them, to make that, to make that change, you know, not continuing. And that, of course, that a legal, uh, a legal problem uh, kind of uh, that we have. And I'm not, not even referring to, to international uh, and to compare uh, law between countries, you know. No, no, it's a global one. And if we don't address it by technical and technological means, we will stay behind. It's also one of the experiences that we shared with Kadija. We need platform. We, we need um, to just enter in the battle, not only counting on justice. Justice will follow the lead, but we have to, to create this lead. That's um, essentially what I, I would like to, to share with you tonight. And I'll let you know now the, the place. Thanks a lot. Thanks again for having given me this opportunity to, to express tonight. Thank you, and, and you are so elegant. I remember uh, when we met in Paris, you had this wonderful charisma to tilt the room towards you, and I thought that's really good for a courtroom, but not so good for a prison. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so just two questions from the, the chat box. Someone's asking, uh, Bianca is asking, what can be done to introduce? Uh, so Bianca Goodson is one of the key whistleblowers in South Africa state capture case, and you guys share a lot in common. She's asking, what can be done to institute something like a global law that will result in countries collaborating to end corruption? 
And I, I know that this is something that William and Professor Poggi are looking at an anti-corruption court because we know the ICC is very limited, it's toothless, it targets demand side countries, for example, many African countries, but it doesn't target supply side countries like Switzerland that create conditions and banks like HSBC. And another question crucially asks, um, what about the FATF? Now we know the FATF uh, circumvents most legal and financial secrecy jurisdictions. Only two countries on the blacklist, North Korea and Iran, and these are both heavily politicized issues. The gray list uh, has Jamaica and Ghana. So it's like they're just cherry picking issues that are easy to frame in a certain way. What do you think about the way in which secrecy jurisdictions like Switzerland managed to elide a lot of the uh, the, the venom that's lobbed towards this kind of thing? Is it attribution error? They look civilized, so they might be civilized. What are your thoughts on that? Well, first of all, um, there are battles that, that we can't um, enter in globally. You know, you, we, we, it's, it's about a dream, you know, to have kind of a blacklist or gray list or whatever list we have, um, searching for a kind of a common agreement, you know, about what we have to do. It, to me, it's, it's an error. The same way that uh, it's an error when I, I, I was talking to, to politician, you know, to high ranked politician uh, in particular in, in Spain uh, a few a few weeks ago uh, about um, let's going back to, to crypto money or what is called crypto money, but crypto asset, whatever. And um, and I, I told them you, you can't you can avoid that. You you have to understand first what is ongoing. You know, for instance. Uh, I, I worked three years over ten last ten years, three full years with governments, with experts, foreignsy to explain what were the mechanisms, the financial mechanisms that are used as of today. And once uh, they they realized what was happening and oh they were doing things, well it resulted that uh, it ended up that the legal system were not able to, to sue the, 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 and, and to avoid those, um, those actions. And this is an ongoing process, you know, but that could pass by academics. I, I'm, I, for instance, uh, we in, uh, in Spain, we are collaborating with, uh, with universities and with academics, we are publishing, and, and this will expose the, the, the problem. You know? We are publishing a kind of fraud schemas, you know, and in it ended up that uh, the only, uh, uh, let's say, the most appropriate uh, journals where uh, we had to publish them were in artificial intelligence and in applied mathematics, and that's the problem, you know, the complexity of of what we are dealing with require education. And a very specialized education, and it needs for it need that the politician are aware of that to put ahead, you know, to to support the the next coming law that will give us the the appropriate tool to 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 confront to that uh, reality. You know, it, it's a kind of uh, like uh, when, when I hear about. Um, unification about uh, tax, it's even worse. What, 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 what was done was, I mean, in, in, in the term of, um, of a global agreement, like the blacklist, were just an incentive for, for them, you know, for the one that were out of the blacklist to become the intermediary for the one that are out of the list. Uh, the opposite, sorry. So you, you get the point, the more you are, uh, you are raising walls yep. and the more we, we are relying on intermediaries that will give you a side way to, to avoid those walls. Yeah. 
Yeah, that is that is absolutely true because you could see when certain, um, for example, more than 50% of the world's legal and financial secrecy islands are under the umbrella of the United Kingdom. And what is interesting is that as soon as they had to institute certain laws in one, the capital was triggered and fled to another. So as you said, unless it happens in a very unified way, to raise the wall of one country will simply trigger off activity and more business uh, in, in another jurisdiction. Um, okay, Herb, uh, that, that was very beautiful and thank you for taking the time uh, with us.